Well, the first thing we saw is the, that he saw is the vessel shaped. When we think about the portrait of God as an absolute sovereign potter, you know, just doing what he wants, it seems harsh and forbidding. But Isaiah kind of gives us an insight that softens the picture. Listen to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, thou our potter, and all of us are the work of thy hands. Now listen, although God is the sovereign potter, he is also the loving father. Think about that. He's not just going, eh, bad clay, you know, thrown off the side. He says, I am your loving father. His shaping is always with love and tenderness. God is absolutely skilled in the shaping of human lives. He does not experiment with us because he's omniscient. He makes no mistakes because he is omnipotent. His work is never spoiled by neglect because he's omnipresent in our lives. It is only when we try to assume his role as potter in our own lives or in the lives of others that the clay gets marred. Now think about that, that God, unlike that human potter in chapter 18 that was just clunking along in his wheel and whipping up clay and, and doing it like that, God is not experimenting with some new design with human beings. The way that he made you and the way that he made me was part of his perfect plan. He wasn't playing around. He didn't say, hmm, oh, that spout kind of looks dumb on that one, but I'll not do that on someone else. I mean, he made us with all of the unique and even hard for us to accept unchangeable features in our life. He made those. He made those for his glory. If there's something about the way that you were made by God with your body, something about the family that you were put in, something about the personality God gave you, if there is something that you have no control over that came with the with the car when it was delivered to you, with your physical body, then that's part of God's heavenly potter's plan. And what we have to do on the wheel is not say, how come I have to have a handle there? We say, God, what do you want to do with that handle? I don't understand what to do with it. Sticking out, and nobody else has one quite like that. Why? God has a plan in all this. And he, when we yield to him, is the heavenly potter. The wheel of our heavenly potter molding our lives, and, and remember that potter was clicking along with this treadle kind of thing, like an old treadle sewing machine, and it made the circular table spin. And then, as you know, you have to throw the clay on dead center, and I mean, there's a lot of spiritual applications to this, but the spinning wheel represents the circumstances and events that make up each day of our life. You see, it's not like that God shaped you back then, you know, whenever back then was. Did you know that God was spinning along the wheel of our lives today and his finger was coming in with something that maybe was a little trial at work or at home or at school or maybe it was last night or whatever and, and God's fingers are, are pressing into our lives and sometimes it's very uncomfortable as he pushes in on us. He uses the events that make up each day spinning through our lives and our response to each event that God sends to us is part of the shaping of our character. Remember that we're all still in the wheel. And God is still shaping us. And some people, they just give up. They say, oh, I'll never do anything for the Lord. And that's the ones that he has to just take and take off the wheel because they won't respond to his shaping. The clay of our life was chosen by God. So we must not question our heredity, our temperament, our place in life. But through the providential dealings that God sends, as in our sorrows and our joys, the prosperities we have and adversities, the trials and temptations, the blessings and bereavements, all those shape our lives. It says in verse 4 that the vessel was marred. Listen to verse 4. As Jeremiah was watching and, and all these thoughts are going through his mind and God's really working with him, the potter's plumping along there, and, and he's really working. And if you've ever watched a potter, you know, it's a critical moment. They, they push in. And what's supposed to happen is they push their fingers in. It's supposed to rise. Have you ever watched? It's really neat to watch. You know, and I've always wanted to do that, and I tried. And it just got clay under my fingers and all over, you know, under my fingernails and all over me and everything. It didn't work. And I'm not a heavenly potter by any means. But you can just see this uh, potter pushing in on that spinning clay, and it's rising. And then maybe he's got his hand inside and he's trying to, 
to, to make it just the right thickness as he's coming up. And just as he was doing that, look at what verse 4 says. But the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. It fell, or it broke through, or something happened. As Jeremiah watches the clay, it collapses on the wheel. No potter purposely causes an object of his work to fail. I mean, it's just not like, you don't just go up and go like a child trying to pop a balloon. Let's see if I can ruin you. You know, a potter doesn't do that. But it's a deficiency in the clay and the clay's response to the potter's touch. Sin of any kind will mar us as God's vessel that he is making. Be it a resistance to his will. And you know, the great people, the great servants of the Lord of the past, that their lives we look to now as lives lived for the Lord, those were people that were so sensitive and never wanted to disobey the will of the Lord. I remember um, when I was little, I used to read a lot of missionary biographies, and, and I remember C.T. Studd, the Cricketeer Pioneer, as the title of the biography was. He used to go through his Bible, and he had a little pen, and he would put a little check mark by every verse that he knew he was obeying. And anything that didn't have a check mark by, he would always pray over him again until he could say, okay, I'm obeying you there, Lord. And he was utterly sensitive to yielding to God's will. And if we do not yield to God's will, if we in, in some way are having a resistance, or maybe we have a wrong relationship with someone, that, that we are not to walk or stand or sit with those that are scorners and disobedient, uh, blessed are those that, that don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And if we are having a wrong relationship in our life, and if we are having someone that's influencing us in some way, or an attitude that we've taken on, be it an attitude of better than thou, or bitterness, or whatever, all of that is bad clay. It has to be disposed of, because he can't work that kind of clay. And once it's disposed of, he can continue. But if that sin, resistance, wrong relationship, bad attitude, remains the shaping ends. See, God wants to work with us, but that's one of the wonders, that he doesn't force himself on us. You know, the Apostle Paul got hit over the head by God's divine baseball bat before he was saved. He was Saul the murderer, and God knocked him off his horse. You know what Paul's testimony was of that day? He said, I didn't disobey the Lord. There has to be a response of our will to God. He does not override our will. He works with us. He woos us. He moves us. He sovereignly and supernaturally works around us. But God will not force you to obey him. And if you won't, it stops the shaping process. The scriptures tell us that God in our lives wants to take away the dross as we yield to his spirit. He wants to take all that hides the beauty of Christ out of our lives so that the beauty of Christ will be on us. You know what the last verse of Psalm 90 says? It's a beautiful verse. I believe Moses wrote Psalm 90. And so it's fantastic in the Hebrew language, the construction of it. And this is what it says in, in the old King James. It says, let the beauty of the Lord thy God be upon thee. But what the word let means is it means hold still. And it's speaking of God wants to, in the soft clay of our lives, impress the image of Christ, and sometimes we're not holding still. It's kind of like when you're trying to comb your children's hair and they're going like this, you know? Or you're trying to wash their face and they're going like this, and, and they just don't want to let you do what they need done. And God says, will you hold still and let the beauty of Christ be upon you? This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's the potter at work. He's, he's shaping into our lives the image of Jesus Christ. Are you yielding? Did you yield today? Are you yielding right now? Is it your heart's desire that when he pokes his finger into a part of my life or your life and it hurts a little bit, we go, mm -mm, that too? You want me to change that too? You know, that we'll say yes, we'll yield in that area. And we let him shape us and we rise to his touch rather than fall down on the wheel. Well, the next point, we see the vessel shaped and then it's marred.
But look at the last part of verse 4, because the vessel is reshaped. And this is the blessing. This is what God sent Jeremiah to see. Again, the potter's going along. He throws the clay on. He starts working. He's forming the vessel. He's getting it to a critical point. The vessel flops. So what does the potter do? Look at the last part of verse 4. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Now, that's an interesting thought. You and I might have been going along here and we made a choice. And it might have been a bad choice. It might have been uh, we picked a wrong direction in our career. We might have picked a wrong partner in life. We might have picked the wrong friend or associate. Maybe we got involved in something we shouldn't have gotten involved in. But you know what? If our hearts soften, if we repented of that, you know what God does? He doesn't scrape us up and throw us in the scrap pile. He starts over again. And what's neat is, and, and, and when I used to pastor the 864 senior saints at Grace Community Church, that's how many were there when I got there. And I started burying them one a week. And because people, when you have 864 people with a median age of 78, you have them dying like this. But you know what? I spent a lot of time at bedsides. I spent a lot of time in ICUs and, and, and the uh, people that were in the, the cancer hospice deals and everything else. And I remember talking to those people, and one thing that impressed me of the saints, every one of them said, he's not through with me. He's still shaping my life. And you know, I thought about that clay. And I thought, you know, there are some 30-year-olds that are hard as rock. God's not going to do anything to me. And I saw some 90-year-olds that God was still putting fine points in and reshaping their lives. And what's neat is, is, as we read in the book of Joel, that God will give us back the locust years. I mean, we can, have, we can have a whole part of our life that was totally lived for the flesh and the sin and for the world. And God says, I'll, I'll just throw that into the scrap pile. I'll remake you into something else for my glory. And that's the blessing. And that's what God wanted Jeremiah to see. What hope comes is we see the potter softening, reworking the clay. Here is the blessed message of hope that God offers. He doesn't throw us away. He reshapes us. God is the God of the second chance just like Peter the denier, or as Jacob the deceiver, or as Abraham the liar, or as Paul the murderer, or John Mark the quitter would testify, the Scriptures are full of the testimonies of those who submit to the potter and are shaped into vessels that are fit for the Master's use. I hope that wherever you are on the potter's wheel, that if his finger has detected some resistant clay, that you'll say, Lord, I don't want that in my life throw it in a scrap pile. There's nothing that means more to me than you. There's nothing more important to me than being responsive to you. I will yield. I will submit. I will be the vessel that is a vessel of honor. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. In a great house are many vessels, vessels for honor and vessels that are for dishonor. Flee all the youthful lusts and all the non-youthful lusts that would keep us from being a vessel unto honor, Paul told Timothy.